Okay, so I'm Anne Marie Bro, and I'm filling in. Um, we're still uh, the product owners are still dividing up um, Kate Borma's previous responsibilities for now. Um, uh, we hope that we'll have news about a new lead product owner soon. Um, but in the meantime, I'm managing the sprint reviews. And so today we have um, demos and updates on the previous two sprints. Um, we, I'm just gonna file through the slides in homage to Kate. If I can actually get to them, okay. So last time we had several new uh, people on Teams. This time, not quite so many new people, but we do have a couple. Um, Andre on uh, Vega as a new backend developer, and Alexi on Firebird as a new also backend developer. Um, Texas A&M is also uh, swapping around some of their folks. They, they have different developers that come off and on the project. So uh, Jeremy is cycling off and William Welling is coming back on. And um, the next couple of sprints for Iris are um, exciting ones. We've got uh, releases coming up. We've got um, migration testing. So all kinds of stuff in the next couple of sprints. Um, you can, uh, you'll be able to access this PowerPoint after the presentation and um, the link to the release timeline is there. And I think Jakob probably put this in about the pull request guidelines. Um, Jakob, do you wanna say anything about um, this or any of the core platform stuff? Or is Jakob here? All right, Jakob's not here. So um, everybody look at the updated pull request guidelines when you get a chance, if you haven't already. Is there anybody here that uh, can speak to them at all or wants to speak to them at all? Um, Mike Grell or uh, anybody else? I don't have anything to add. Okay, follow the link, look at the stuff. Okay, sprint highlights um, for core platform, lots of Okapi and RMB stuff. Um, and you've got everybody else's in there. Should you want to linger on any of them in the PowerPoint um, after the meeting? And we have not quite as many demos today as we normally do, but that's good. Maybe we'll get out a little bit early. So and Marie, there was, uh, I'm, oh, I'm sorry, just a quick forgot. thing that I wanted to mention, uh, and I was late to this meeting, so uh, That's okay. some might have skipped that. Uh, I was asked by the TechWix team uh, to just bring to everyone's attention that, uh, attention that the pull request guidelines have been updated. Uh, they have been discussed over, over the course of a couple TechWix meetings, um, and uh, there aren't any unexpected changes, I guess, but I would ask everybody to sort of, you know, review them and, 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 and familiarize themselves with it uh, if they haven't done already. And that's the link uh, that you're just presenting. So that's it. Okay, thank you, Jakob. Thanks. All right, so for demos, first up is Snowy Belarus and Thunderjet. So Andre first, and I'll stop yeah. sharing. Hi all, let me share my screen. I believe you can see it. Um, so uh, the features I'm going to present is uh, expert orders and orders uh, lines results. Uh, uh, for now we decided to use uh, front end uh, 
only approach, and uh, that means that uh, we fetch all the required data from backend and then uh, combine it uh, and create CSV file uh, with the help of uh, export CSV function from Stripes. Uh, and um, okay, so is there were some technical details, and uh, now uh, let's see how it's presented on the UI and how it works. So. Uh, if we see uh, on the right uh, top corner, we see new action menu that was added. And here we can see new option, it's uh, export results, CSV, so it's disabled for now. Uh, until uh, we have no uh, items in the search list. Uh, and if we check one filter, so okay, we have, uh, Eight uh, hundreds and one order lines, and now we can try to check it again, and it's enabled. Uh, so let's click on it, and here we can see the export settings model, and uh, where user can configure his, um, what uh, he wants uh, to export. So there are two options to export. Uh, all the data for purchase orders and purchase of the lines, or it's possible to select only the fields that are really needed for users. So let's select by default all the data for PO and some fields for PO line, and then click exports so uh, there is some instructions uh, for user and um, i want to explain that uh, export time is depends on numbers of uh, exporting items uh, and uh, mm, if we try to export uh, not more than 1000 uh, of them it uh, takes uh, usually 10 or 20 seconds uh, it's not critical for user i believe and here we can see that our uh, file was uh, successfully created and downloaded it so if we open it we'll see all uh, purchase order data and then uh, from the online number. Here we can see our three columns uh, from uh, uh, PO line. And if we scroll down to the bottom, we'll see that here is presented uh, to 802 lines uh, minus the one line with uh, titles. So all uh, our pictures of the lines were successfully exported and um, the same functionality we have for, for orders. Here we can see the same uh, action menu with uh, experts uh, results options. Uh, that's me, thank you. Thanks, Andre, that looks awesome. Thank you. Um, and Alexi. Yeah, I can continue. Let me share my screen. Hope you can see it. Um, yes. Basically, uh, uh, according to export, uh, we have the same actually uh, result, export result for orders. Uh, so it was no like, reason to display the same result twice, uh, but here we are going to implement, maybe implement more proper uh, batch expert approach in future. Uh, so it's like uh, something that we can give for uh, not big amount of data uh, to users. Mm. So uh, going to, mm, I'm going to present you uh, old acquisition units. Uh, as you may know, we have in settings acquisition units, and uh, I've created a couple. Uh, usually, they can be used to restrict access um, 
to some uh, entities uh, like orders. Uh, in our case, uh, we were working uh, for funds in UI finance. Uh, so we have like uh, restricted to view uh, acquisition unit and the, uh, it makes uh, only assigned users uh, to be able to view this fund. Uh, or fund assigned to this acquisition unit. And uh, another one just for edit, create, and delete. So, but uh, anyone can view this fund. So, uh, and if uh, some tenant or organization needs to restrict uh, uh, usage or visibility of, of funds, they can go to finance, and uh, for funds, I've created one for view, uh, and uh, it has like restricted to view equation unit, and uh, another one, it's uh, edit. So basically, uh, it's set up from the form equation units. That's it. Uh, so user. Uh, we have uh, only Dico assigned to these funds. So uh, that's like a usual way when we go to uh, orders, uh, invoice, I will show for orders. And uh, if you are go, going to uh, create a push third line and uh, you have to put price and if you want to distribute this across the funds, uh, you will be able to see uh, both uh, restricted funds since we under DQ. Uh, what happened uh, if we are not, let me uh, add these funds. We can uh, divide 50-50. So uh, now I'm going to login under uh, another user that is not part of th this uh, acquisition units. Uh, so we have access to finance orders applications and if you go to orders uh, we can see this PO line what we can see in uh, details since we have no uh, access to restricted uh, fund we're not able to go uh, or to see that name however we can see uh, another fund that is not required for view uh, permission for you. Uh, the same for edit form. Uh, we can see, uh, we, we cannot see a restricted fund in the list. However, we can uh, see another fund, another funds. Uh, and uh, actually, user might uh, remove this uh, distribution uh, or change it to another fund. Uh, basically, that's it uh, from my side. Uh, acquisition units, uh, moving to finance, uh, that kind of improvement. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Alexi. Um, all right. It looks like Firebird is next. Vlad? Yes, thank you. I'll, I'll share my screen and yes, I hope you can see it. And today we'll show you uh, almost a full flow for remote storage and including uh, connected it with location and tenant settings and using it in inventory. And it's, we start with creating new remote storage configuration. And uh, if you want to change something, 
now we can do this, for example, this way. And now we will go to location and tenant settings in and connect our um, configurations that we created with uh, location that already created before by myself. And here we can choose our location and save it. Uh, after that, we can move to inventory and choose this location for some holdings or items. And let's move here. And save it. And here we can choose our location and save it. After that, uh, we will move back to our location. And now uh, we, when we're trying to change another remote location, uh, remote storage, we can do this because it's already stated with uh, our holding. And when we move back location and when we try to move from remote location to non-remote location because it's almost remote yeah we will see this notification that we need to connect with remote storage location to finish this change and after save in uh, settings in our location, let's open it. Uh, we can move to another remote storage or set it's like not remote storage location and we can do this. And now in remote storage, we actually can delete our configuration that we created previously. Yeah, actually it's a bit for demo. Thank you. All right, getting all the pieces in place. Thank you. Um, all right, next we've got Spitfire, Kalila. Hey guys. Um, so Dennis is gonna present uh, some of the work we, we've done to um, migrate our UI tests to uh, just and he's also going to uh, demo a feature we've added to the eHoldings title record where you can apply a note at the, at the title level. So Dennis, take it away. Yep, um, thank you, Lila. Hi, everyone. Um, so let me share my screen. Oh, no, that's not my screen. <laughs> um, just a second. So you probably should see it now. Um, yeah, so uh, during the last right, two we're, sprints. We're just seeing black screen. Right? Oh. oh, no, here it came. Oh, so okay, great. Right. Yep. Okay. Yep, good. Um, yeah, so for the last two sprints, we've been mainly working on um, some bug fixes and improvements. And also we have um, migrated uh, tests from big tests to Jest and RTL in two of our modules. So one module is, is uh, UI notes. And um, as you can see, we have 90% um, uh, of, of coverage in uh, this module. And this is uh, done with uh, just, test, uh, just tests. And the second module is um, UI plugin find package title. And uh, in this one, we have um, about 83% uh, percent of coverage. Um, yeah, and uh, we still have a couple of modules to um, to migrate to Jest, but uh, I guess that's um, that's a start. Um, okay, uh, that's um, it regarding tests. And um, the next thing I want to show you is um, um, adding notes according to titles uh, in the holdings. So let's uh, search for some title. Um, for example, this one. 
And you can see that uh, we have now um, we have now an ability to add nodes to titles. And uh, let's uh, do that now. Let's create a new node. Um, uh, name it something like uh, title test node and some description. Uh, save it. And you can see that uh, this note has appeared on the title page. And uh, this note will, um, uh, so it will still be available on uh, titles, even if it's uh, not selected in a package. So for example, uh, as in this one, this title. Um, and uh, like functionality is basically the same as we have uh, in other places uh, that has nodes. Um, yeah, I think that's um, that's all I, that I wanted to share with you. Um, um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to, to answer them in chat. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dennis. And Anton will be very happy about the just stuff. That's all great. right. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, next is Thor, Mike Taylor. Uh, am I sharing successfully? Yes. Jolly good. So what I want to show you is it's a feature that's variously been called single record exports or copy cataloging. And it's the ability to pull in from a Z3950 server a mark record, which then uh, is added to the, uh, what do we call it, source record store in Folio, and um, then translated into an uh, inventory bibliographic record that's usable in inventory like any other. So uh, the way this works is uh, with this import item on the actions menu in, in inventory. And now I'm going to enter a WorldCat identifier. Before I do that, uh, I would like a volunteer, please, to show this is not a rig demo. Uh, give me a book and I'll, I'll look it up on WorldCat and we'll import it. Waiting for someone to unmute. All right, somebody. Curse of Lono. Which what is one? that, sorry? Hunter S. Thompson, The Curse of Lono. Okay, well, this has turned into a demo of how bad World Cat searching is, so I guess <laughs> I'm just going to go with this one on readings in cultural anthropology instead. Uh, so, somewhere down here, we should see the OCLC number, which I'm now going to paste in. And we go off and find the record using Z3950. And I'll show you how that's configured in a moment. Now, what would normally happen is that this record would appear in a, a second or so, and then we will go straight to it in inventory. Unfortunately, there's a problem on the back end at the moment with the data import module, uh, which means that uh, for whatever reason, that record isn't uh, becoming visible in inventory quickly enough, but we can search for it, it is there. If I do an identifier search for the same OCLC ID that we just added, here's the record, Readings in Cultural Anthropology. And what I would like to do now, uh, and again, I'm not going to be able to show you this frustratingly, is here in Actions, there's the, the View Source menu item is grayed out. And here we would normally be able to show you, and Anne-Marie will testify that she's seen this working, uh, the mark data that was imported uh, so that we can verify by eye that Green the check. fields are being correctly mapped. Yes. Now, uh, we as software engineers obviously hate the idea of, of wiring into our software knowledge of individual backend services uh, like OCLC's WorldCat. So the software behind this is more general than that and it's to do with Z3950 import in general. So if I show you the settings for this, inventory settings down at the bottom single record import and please accept my apologies that this is so squashed um, obviously there's work to be done on how this is configured but the raw information you can see here i've highlighted uh, there's the name this is the z3950 contact details uh, don't look at this uh, authentication secret you're not allowed to know that and then a specification of how you do the search given the appropriate kind of identifier so if you're a Z3950 fiend, you may know that the bib1 attribute 1211 means OCLC identifier. 
And there's a couple of other bits in this profile that I won't bother you with the tedious parts of it. Um, but you'll notice we've got two profiles here. This one is currently enabled. So I'm going to disable that one and enable this Library of Congress pro profile. And you can see the way this configuration is laid out is the same, but all the details are different. Here's the 3950 connection details, uh, host name, port, and, and database. So now if we go back to inventory and we want to import something from the Library of Congress catalog. I'm sorry this is so slow. My poor old laptop is struggling under load. Okay, while we wait for that to pop up, let's go over to the Library of Congress catalog and we'll have another, see if we can find that Hunter S. Thompson book. It's a very 1990s thing, isn't it? Checking your browser before accessing. Okay, well, we don't have that. Here we go, Curse of Lono. All right. So the, uh, where's the LCC in? Here we go. So if we come back over here now to Folio, we can import this by Library of Congress identifier. So it's the same software. It's doing the same thing as Z3950. Uh, but it's going to a different server and it's formulating the query in a different way. Um, and infuriatingly, as before, it's just a little too slow doing the import, but now we can see it's picked it up. So here it is. So this one came in from Library of Congress, the other from OCLC. And there's nothing special about those two services. So whatever Z3950 service you find helpful, maybe you have one uh, to do with a union catalog of your state's holdings or something like that, you can wire that in yourself. So that's where we are with this. Uh, the frustration is that these uh, regressions in the back end prevent me from showing you a couple of other bits and pieces. Uh, I mentioned the problem with uh, seeing the source record. Also, I think it's a manifestation of the same bug. Um, what we can do is within an existing instance record, we can re-import uh, and then that will allow us, for example, if the cataloging on uh, OCLC's WorldCat has changed, we can bring that back in again uh, and get the uh, replaced values for the fields that have changed. But that also, at the moment, is not working because of this disconnect between the instance records and the underlying uh, source records. But uh, you'll just have to take my word for it at the moment that that, that functionality exists uh, and it's just a matter of that regression being fixed in uh, the data import module. Mike, can you go back to settings for just a second? Yes. Uh, and let me just reiterate my apology that the settings are so ugly. No, it's OK. Um, so with the settings, I, I'm assuming you can only have one enabled at a time? Or um, you... No, my plan is, and I, I haven't quite had time to implement that for this, that if you have more than one enabled, then when you open the import modal, it'll give you a little drop down and offer you a choice of what you want to import from um, Library of Congress, OCLC, or whatever else it might be. Okay, that would be cool. And yeah, this is going to be huge help for um, the for acquisitions people who start with, I'm going to go download a record and then place my order. And for catalogers who want to update brief records or um, less less than full records with the more complete records. So people are going to love this. Great. That's really good to know. And Jen's saying being able to configure the different services is really great. Yes. yes. So E39.50, any target. Yeah. So while I'm here, I may as well explain what this uh, horrible opaque identifier is. Uh, this is how we tell the single record input system that the relevant identifier to use for this is the uh, LC control number. And this is the UUID of that identifier type within Folio. So as we get a bit more time to work on the settings pages for this, obviously we'll present that as the name of the identifier and we'll let you choose it from a, a drop down list rather than expecting you to know and type in a UUID. So it would have to be a... Um, a pretty unique, like if you were using a consortial catalog number, you'd need to, it, it'd be best if you had a separate identifier type for that number. 
yeah. and not yeah. just random system number. Okay. Yeah, and provided the Z3950 server has a way of searching by its favored identifier, yeah. then you'll be fine with this. All right, very cool. Okay, shall I stop sharing and hand on? Yes, please. All right, thanks for listening, everyone. All right, next is Vega with Darcy. Great, thanks, Anne-Marie. Um, while Vega has been chipping away at two very large features for item block overrides and patron block overrides, um, we have three short demos today. Um, one is in addition to the refund report, which we actually demoed before, we have a new filter in column. Um, and then also a fee fine detail report, which we actually took on and, and um, you know, did very quickly. It's a front end only story um, that somebody had asked us if we could actually take on this, this um, release. And um, we were able to do that and, and, ship away and get it done really quickly. And then the other one is um, this, when we had the automated, uh, or the, sorry, the patron blocks, automated or manual, um, that would appear at checkout, um, we never really took into account before the proxy and the sponsor um, component. And so now that is um, an add-on that we've accomplished that's um, now working correctly. So I will pass it over to Alex K. Hey everyone, I'm gonna share my screen. Hopefully you can see it. So last time we've shown you a refunds report and yeah, I've mentioned then that we're gonna extend it by adding a column, a fee owner column and fee owner filter. And that's what I'm gonna demo. Uh, so we have this patron with a bunch of fees and fines. And as you can see, all of them are either refunded partially or refunded fully. But this time they come from three different fee owners. So let's try to download our report and see what happens. Uh, let's go back to users, actions, refunds to process manually. So this is the first change, this fee fine owner filter, which allows us to select either single or multiple fee fine owners, or we can leave it blank if we want to include everything in the report, regardless of the owner. Let's do that first. Let's say we want everything for today. So this is the report and these are five rows related to our patron. And this is the second change, this fee find owner column, which shows that we have in fact, three different owners. Uh, now let's say that we're only interested in these two, fee find owner one and two, and try to filter out everything else. Let's go back to uh, this dialog select these two owners. And we should see the report with, uh, with just those two rows. Yeah, here it is. So just a little update on our refund report work. And I think that's all I have. Thank you. And Anna's next. Hi, everyone. I'm sharing my screen. Can you see it? Yep. Uh, okay, I'm going to demo the fee fine report with very detailed pattern fees fines. As we can see, current pattern has um, seven open fees fines and one closed fine. We can export a spreadsheet from three places. Uh, first of them is user details page. And here we have an uh, option. Uh, the next place is, uh, if you find a history page. And uh, the last place, uh, if you find details page. Uh, These uh, three spreadsheets uh, are similar, so I will demo only one report. Um, we can see here all 
defines um, of current uh, pattern and uh, as uh, you can see here we have 38 lines but before we saw that pattern has uh, only eight finds seven open and one closed so um, this means that this report contains all actions uh, which were applied for patterns finds. Here we can see all actions, uh, including creating fine, wave, paid, refunded, cancelled, everything. Uh, also, current um, uh, spreadsheet contains uh, a lot of links, so user uh, can easily get to everything uh, he need, like pattern barcode navigates to user details page. And um, uh, here we can see uh, the link to find details page, uh, item details. Also, we can go and um, to see the overdue policy, lost item fee policy, and we can go to the loan details page. Um, that's all about the spreadsheet. Also, if um, uh, patron doesn't have any uh, fees fines, so the export option and um, export button will be just uh, inactive. As it's all from my side, thank you for your attention. Great, thanks Anna. I know that's gonna be really helpful to people trying to figure out and troubleshoot some issues that, or what patrons might view as issues with fee fines. <laughs> um, and then Dimitri is next with our proxy sponsor checkout. Hello, I already stopped sharing the screen. Please send me the way you will see it. Yeah, we can. We see it. Okay. First of all, we select a sponsor uh, that uh, have blocks. We select. Uh, we can see we have a pattern block. Uh, we'll try to check out item and now we are available to check out it. Uh, next our case, uh, we want to select a pattern, uh, but uh, uh, we will use uh, we will use it as a proxy. And uh, how you can see, uh, current user uh, don't have any pattern box and uh, we available for checkout item. Okay, we also uh, select uh, all current user one more time. Uh, we will select uh, proxy uh, that uh, have pattern box. We select. We can see that uh, we have uh, another pattern block reason, and now we are unavailable for checkout item. That's all. Do you have any question? Thanks, Dimitri. I know this was a really important feature because otherwise the automated patron block only worked for the person that was actually at the desk scanning the card. So um, it didn't work correctly for sponsors and proxies. So thanks. Thank you. I can remember testing sponsors and proxies like two years ago with some of the <laughs> early work. It's amazing how never ending all of the circulation and, and uh, user work is. All right, so next is Folajet. Um, Masha is going to uh, show uh, a change that we've made to the way that HRID right. in inventory. Um, 
in response to, um, in particular, Chicago, but basically libraries that um, uh, have issues with the initial zeros padding for, for the HRIDs. And then Volodia is going to show a couple updates we've made to the default mark to instance uh, map. And then Kate Centrenko is gonna talk about the um, migration for a lot of data import, but not all of it from uh, using PubSub to using Kafka Direct. So, Masha. Yes, hello everyone. I'm sharing my screen. Do you see it? Yes. Okay, so inventory charity settings allowed for 11 numbers, uh, which may or may not be preceded by alpha um, prefixes. And by default, we pet the number with leading zeros. Uh, but now we can change it. So it's possible to generate new HRIDs without leading zeros. And to do this, I should navigate to settings page for inventory. and find the charity handling section. So here we have a new checkbox for removing leading zeros from charity. And once I click on this, um, <clears throat> leading zeros are removed from all start with fields. And I also don't want to assign prefix to new holdings. So let's save our form and navigate back to the inventory module. So I'm going to create a new um, instance. Mm -hmm. Save it. And here we can see a new instance in HRD generated without leading zeros. I also want to add a new holding. Mm -hmm. Let's save it and view it. It's in resources. Okay, let's wait a little bit. Okay, so here we can see that holdings HRID was uh, generated without leading zeros and without a uh, prefix because I removed it from the settings. And we have the same functionality for items, but I'm not gonna demonstrate it now. Um, and uh, I think that's it from me. If you have any questions, please ask. Thanks, Masha. Definitely will be helpful for some of the, the ones that are coming up in July. And Velodia? Hello, everyone. Let me share my screen. Can you see it? Yes. Jira, right? Yes. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, today I want to demonstrate to you two new stories regarding default mapping for data import. Uh, so the first one is about uh, specific uh, five OO fields uh, called nodes, uh, which you can see here. Uh, so if there is indicator uh, zero, then it will be staff only checkbox. If another symbol, uh, then not staff only. And another story um, is this is about mapping 880 field based on first three digits uh, after number six. 
So uh, the mapping will be uh, mapped for the field, which was found as first three digits after six number. Uh, there are some repeatable fields, that's why they should be hard coded for specific uh, for specific mark uh, fields. So let's check all this functionality. So uh, uh, we have this mark file with only one record and uh, specific uh, five OO fields. For example, uh, here we can see 541 uh, field with uh, leading zero, so it will be staff only node. For example, here it another symbol, so it will be public. And for the another ticket, we can see 880 field with uh, three digits after six number is 245. So it uh, should be mapped as alternate title with a testing meeting name, for example. So let's uh, check all of this. Let's import this file, which I showed to you using a default import, a default job profile. <clears throat> Yes, import completed. Let's retrieve instance char ID. And uh, let's found this instance in inventory. So we can see it here. And let's discover nodes and alternate type so yeah for instance nodes only stuff only uh, nodes are stuff only public are not stuff only and there are a lot of them and regarding alternate title we can see uh, my like random uh, string here so that's all from my side. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Volodia. And so for the 880s, which are the, the alternate graphical representations, um, if you have um, uh, Cyrillic or you have uh, Hebrew or Arabic um, or any of the Asian languages, this is um, kind of a, a temporary um, way to make sure that that data is exposed in inventory. Ideally, the title and the alternate title in the alternate graphical representation would be at the same level, but we can't have two titles right now in inventory. Um, so we're doing it as an alternate. All right, and uh, last is Kate. Yes, yeah, hi everyone. I'm about to share my screen. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. So uh, I'd like to say a few words about the major data import refactoring uh, that happens happened across the modules involved in uh, data import process. Uh, this change was merged a few weeks ago, and the main reason for that uh, was to improve data import performance and increase its um, reliability. So in essence, uh, the uh, refactoring changes the data import data exchange from uh, using Modpop sub to going directly through Kafka. And on this picture, um, you should see uh, well, the flow how it worked before. Uh, so data import process is uh, quite complex and uh, it consists of various sections on multiple entities that take place um, across several modules. And interaction between these modules uh, relied heavily on HTTP, uh, which placed a lot of pressure on Folio infrastructure. 
Um, in addition to that, we had a separate exceptional flow for importing Mark Beeps and creating the corresponding instances uh, that was triggered by the so-called uh, secret button. And it happened uh, only via HTTP. So on the uh, that diagram presented the current approach. And you can see that mod data import, mod source record manager, uh, mod source record storage, and mod inventory uh, are now exchanging data uh, directly via Kafka without uh, mod pops up acting as a proxy for this process. Uh, from the user perspective, uh, nothing has changed uh, except that we don't have this uh, secret button functionality uh, over here anymore um, and uh, um, data import can be triggered only by selecting the appropriate job profile um, instead of that secret button functionality we are now have the default job profile built in that would create the srs mark beeps and corresponding inventory instances using the default mark to instance mapping and to run the job, you just uh, should click this run button um, and the file should be imported. I will not uh, do this right now because uh, we experience some problems with data import functionality on the reference ends, but uh, normally you can run the job just like that. Um, so all required configuration related to Kafka and environment uh, variables will be mentioned in the release notes um, and uh, the readme for the involved modules will be uh, updated accordingly. Um, and I think it is also important to mention that um, uh, with uh, introducing direct uh, interaction with Kafka, we did not deprecate um, what pops up. Uh, in fact, the mark quick, uh, uh, quick mark updates and uh, other uh, circulation related operations are still going through what pops up and uh, can continue to do so. Um, that's all I wanted to uh, present. Thank you for your attention. If you have any question, please um, contact Apologize to me. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. And we um, we were especially wanting to get this done because we are um, either this sprint or early next sprint going to be connecting up to mod invoice, and so we um, we wanted to have all of this ironed out before we we got to mod invoice. All right, um, core functional, Sergey. Thank you, Marie. I'm going to share my screen. I hope you can see it. Yes. Okay, well, and before I get started, I'd like to mention that um, as many people know, at, at least the front end guys for sure, part of the sprint, uh, Zach and Michal uh, have been busy with polar stripes issues, fixing the circular dependency and a lot of other technical work. Obviously we cannot show this, but it's very important. Uh, therefore the main work in this sprint uh, that can be demoed today was focused on uh, interacting with new item statuses. And I'm gonna start with showing the actions so actions menu uh, in the item detail page. And you can see the uh, long list, uh, all of these uh, newly added options mark as. Uh, and uh, let's make sure that uh, uh, they work exactly the same as the items with status intellectual items and restricted that uh, were shown in the previous sprint, sprint review. And for our example, let's take an item with, uh, let's take an, an item with, with uh, a request, with open request on it. And 
after clicking uh, on the, for example, long, long mission mark, long mission menu, um, the confirmation model appears here with uh, the uh, corresponding status, long mission. Uh, and uh, as you can notice, uh, the system notifies us about the open request uh, for this item with uh, with a link to the request application here yeah. and let's repeat one missing and after confirmation the status of the item changes to the selected one uh, in our case long missing and uh, in turn uh, the system allows uh, transition from one of these new statuses to another. You can see that I can uh, mark this item as unavailable and it works. And now the status is unavailable. And at the same time, you can see that the new request option is missing here. It means that the system doesn't allow create a new request for the items with uh, statuses intellectual item, in process non requestable, on missing, unavailable, and unknown. And uh, now let's move to uh, to the check in and check out uh, items with the new statuses. Let's take this one and after scanning this item in checkout application uh, the confirmation model message says uh, that the item has status in process non request about the new status and it suffers from discovery. Its message uh, appears here because uh, the checkbox is selected, uh, suppressed from discovery in uh, item details page. Mm. Confirm uh, the if we check in this item. Uh, you can see the same message uh, in check-in confirmation model and after confirm uh, you can see that uh, the item has status in transit uh, to service point for effective location uh, that's it about uh, uh, new item statuses and uh, let me let me uh, turn to the uh, new functionality something like new functionality for your inventory application I want to present to you the uh, result list column chooser uh, that this time an in inventory application let's get uh, the result list here and um, you can see here are three checkboxes it, it looks and works like uh, an already existing feature in UI user in users application which uh, makes it possible uh, to choose which columns uh, should be visible in the result list here you are uh, that's it from me. Uh, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please ask. Thank you, Sergey. And believe it or not, it's the last demo um, from Falcon Team, Bogdan and Pavel. Pavel, sorry. And while they're getting ready, be thinking about do you want almost half an hour of time back or do you want to ask some questions or discuss anything that's been presented today? 
Yeah. Hi guys, let me share my screen. Um, okay, so today I'm going to show you a couple of uh, search options that we have implemented. And uh, yeah, also I'll show you um, sorting by title and contributors and the last thing that I, I'm going to show is uh, about multi-language search. So let's start with, uh, with search options. Um, so we have implemented these uh, keyword options that um, uh, searches against um, title, contributors, and uh, identifiers. Um, for example, if we um, now try to search by by title, we get um, uh, instances that has this web word in the in the title. Um, um, we also can uh, pick identifier and try to search using the identifier. Yeah, it also works. And uh, yeah, we also can search by contributor. Yeah, so here we have this Frank contributor. Um, Next, the uh, next option is um, UID. Um, let me just um, copy UID, instance UID. Yeah, I'm expecting to get just uh, yeah just one uh, instance, and it is also possible to use uh, wildcard characters like like this for example yeah we, we get the same instance um yeah next option is uh contributors just contributors i have shown you contributors uh, as part of keyword search option but we, we also allow to search by just uh this property contributors um yeah, it is. We have also implemented search uh, sor sorting uh, for title. Um, yeah, it works in any direction, as in inventory, and by contributors as well. Um, yes, yeah, the point for contributors, um, science it is um, um, multi-value. It is an array of um, contributors. Uh, we you we pick just. Uh, the first contributor or a primary contributor if this exists. Um, okay, next uh, next search option I'm going to show in um, Postman. It is um, search by subjects uh, and please also mention this, um, please also note this expand all property that allow us to return um, um all fields for the instance because by default we just return basic instance properties for example um id instance id identifiers contributors and title um yeah so let's just try it um okay so here we have yeah, subjects with automatic indexing well as that we are uh, looking for um, the same here. Um, okay, and uh, last thing that I want to show this um, multi-language search. So we have uh, some uh, configured um, multi-language language analyzers and an institution should pick just up to five um, languages that should be um, processed by these analyzers. The reason why we are limiting um, the amount of um, languages because uh, every this, uh, every every new um, language is separate uh, property, and uh, we have a lot of uh, properties that should support multi-language search, and so. 
at some point we may have we may get um, a blown index so we just we just limit into to some two to five languages and um, how it basically works um, yeah I'm going to show you uh, for English language. If I search for um, instance with um, with uh, by by this uh, index word, um, you you may mention that you 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 can see that I also have um, results with indexing um, index and probably somewhere should be indexed. Um, yeah, so we, we, we ignoring this um, for ending and so on. For example, I even can uh, try to search by uh, indexed and I still get in this indexing in, in, in response index and so on. Um, that's basically it from my side. Pavel is going to show some more uh, features that we have implemented. Over to you, Pavel. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, let me... Uh, can you say if you're able to see it or not? Yes. So I will continue with uh, some basic features that we added to the search. One of them is uh, correct exception handling to make uh, the exceptions that occurred during execution of requests uh, uh, readable. So for example, if some one of during the tenant initiation tries to create uh, the same index that already exists for Elasticsearch, we will see the uh, corresponding error that uh, will say us that uh, index already exists. It could be usable for DevOps or other teams that will maintain the de deployment of a cluster. Also, if we try to search with lower value, uh, upper value than existing, and we face with some limits, we will see that this property should be limited by 500, uh, like hard coded. And that's it for uh, exception handling. I will continue with uh, search possibilities. Uh, there is a few search queries that I will demonstrate. Uh, as I see, uh, as I demonstrated in this, uh, this query support uh, the prefix it will card and postfix. So we can try to use this query to find the all classification uh, numbers uh, in Elasticsearch starting with K300. Uh, and in, in the result, you, you can see there's a lot of uh, instances with uh, uh, classification number starting with QA300. Also, we can use it to find all the numbers ending with and intermediate value between it. So, middle value. Uh, also, uh, we make search uh, easy to add new fields to the index and all we need is just to make the index after the mappings have, have been changed, the meta schema for instance research. So, and also I will demonstrate the other fields like uh, we will, we added uh, support for publisher search. So we can, oh, I'm sorry, this mistake. Uh, we can add, uh, find all publishers starting with uh, shoe and there is a pretty popular publisher that show a string press, which contains a lot of requests. And I mentioned again that we have, currently we have exact uh, amount of records for each query. It's not approximate, really it's exact. Uh, also, we have a search by electronic access. So we can uh, try to use uh, this search to find the exact match for this uh, link value. Also, we can use the same search to find all resources starting with uh, this link uh, related to this electronic uh, locator. Uh, the same multi-language search supported for public node. 
and material specification and link text. Um, sorry. I don't know why it's not working, but it doesn't matter. I have another query. Yeah, for material specification, it's also full text search, it, and it depends on the language uh, specified in the resource. Uh, for public, not I will, can demonstrate the query too. It will be as, as the same behavior. We can use search for the, uh, finding the resource by this term. And the last one, it's uh, search by link text. And we can search all uh, resources that contains ebook in the link text value. Uh, I guess that's me from my side. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Pavel. Um, so we've got about 15 minutes. Does anybody have uh, questions or want to discuss anything that's been demonstrated? Um, does everybody just want to get out of here? All right, let me share my screen again real quickly. All right, interrupt me if you wanna ask something or talk about something. Um, the next couple of sprints are uh, regular two week sprints. Um, they are, um, we're getting toward the end of development for IRIS. So there's uh, deadlines for um, the core modules and then for the complete modules, there's um, migration testing, there's, um, finishing up RMB updates and Stripes updates if you're not done with them. Um, everyone's plans for the next couple of sprints are here in the deck. And if you have interest in any particular ones, please check with the appropriate teams. And that is pretty much all that I know. All right, any parting words from anybody? There are a couple of questions in chat, Anne-Marie. Oh, okay, I missed the end of chat. All right. All right, now I can't see chat, let's see. Um, so about the query stuff, um, from Owen to start with, where you've got UUID references in the JSON for example, for identifier type, is it possible to narrow search by the named type? I think it is uh, for us, yes. Yes. Um, uh, we don't support um, na named identifier search for now, but uh, I think it will be sooner for uh, ISSN and ISBN too, but for now we don't support. Okay, and there's a question about um, for the for the inventory keyword searches. Is there a way to force it to use exact match versus fuzzy match? Yes, I can answer to this question. Uh, is there, yes, there is a possibility to do it. It's not supported yet, but if it would be requirement, we can do it. Okay, so if it needs to be a requirement, um, then um, Brooks, was it Brooks? Um, somebody should definitely talk with um, the PO, which is, is it Magda is the PO for this? I can't remember. Yes, Magda is the PO okay. for, for this. Uh, and uh, this is a very good feedback and, and can be incorporated into the feedback, feedback of the POC. Um, <laughs> evaluation once we start uh, uh, once we start uh, getting feedback of uh, of what was implemented currently we are slowly starting to run out of time there are not much time that are uh, that is left in this uh, release so we are just trying to uh, to provide the most common functionality so the POC, will it be 
live in Iris, so when you go into inventory, um, you're going to have these options or or uh, this will be a separate application like you saw on the demo. This was uh, an additional new uh, Elasticsearch uh, application that will partially support existing uh, search functionality. So there will be an inventory and an inventory ES? That's correct. Okay. Um, ba, 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 ba. So then Mark said uh, probably not good to add them to the wiki documentation. And yeah, if it's going to be separate, maybe we either don't add them or we um, we mark them separately. Um, Jackie Gottlieb's asking on the ES inventory keyword search, can we search by custom fields? Not yet, and it will uh, be not supported in PLC. Does, does inventory support custom fields yet? I can't remember. No, it does not. Okay. <clears throat> It's only users uh, who has implemented uh, customizable fields. And POC is just inventory, is that right? <clears throat> the, the POC yes. is just the inventory? Okay. Yeah. Um, Owen Stevens, my experience with librarians is when you search for indexed and you find index, that's why the wildcards <clears throat> are good, I think, um, for exact versus fuzzy-ish. This is again a very good feedback that we can uh, incorporate once we start uh, uh, soliciting feedback for the PLC. All right, Elasticsearch takes the takes the title for the most questions. Anything else from anybody for today? All right, there's a flock of like 40 crows that just landed in my front yard. So I think we're being invaded. So thanks everybody. And um, lots of work coming up in the next few weeks and looking forward to our next demo in four weeks. All right, everybody have a good afternoon, evening and we'll talk again soon.